When devout Muslims cut the throat of one of their victims, why do they do that? Whose example are they following? Right now in the news, the Central African Republic is being racked by murder after murder after murder. The Washington Post today reported about a 23-year-old Christian man who was in the wrong neighborhood at the wrong time, carrying firewood to be sold. A group of Muslim men jumped him, taunted him, beat him, threw him in a ditch, and then one of them ceremoniously cut his throat. Of course, he died, and there has been untold grief and sorrow for this young man, as well as others who are being brutalized. UN peacekeeping forces are there and they're not keeping much peace. There was a coup a few months back. Uh, the Muslim minority had a coup, took over the government. It's a mess. But to come back to my question, why the throat cutting? You might remember the poor soul, Nicholas Berg, who was captured and murdered in cold blood. He was, and if we've got small children in the room, you wanna, we're not going to show anything, but you want to have them out because of the content. He was um, put down on the ground, and then the murderer, Al-Zarqawi, took a blade out. But before he did it, before he sliced his throat, and he literally hacked his head off with a knife, this is what Al-Zarqawi said. The prophet, the master of the merciful, and by the way, that's speaking of Muhammad when he says the prophet. The prophet, the master of the merciful, has ordered to cut off the heads of some of the prisoners of Badar in patience. He is our example and a good role model. Now, one of the translations that I saw said that he has ordered that Muhammad ordered the slow cutting of the prisoners' necks. And so it wasn't just a guillotine decapitation or with a scimitar. It was the slow, methodic, tor horrific, torturous cutting of a human being's neck like a farmer in a poor area might slaughter uh, his cow. Well, the reason that they do it, and, and by the way, forgive me for going on this rabbit trail, when I saw the original footage of Nicholas Berg just before he was killed and I could see Al Zarqawi talking, I was saying, what is he saying? What is he saying? He, the, the murderer is saying something. And the American press, the national news, not one of them, not one, translated what Al Zarqawi was saying. What kind of news coverage is that? The man is making a declaration and he's saying something that is so foundational to Islam. He's saying, the prophet, the master of the merciful, has given us instructions to cut off or to slice the necks, to cut off the heads of some of the prisoners at Badar. For those of you who don't know, Badar was the first major battle that the Muslims won against the forces of Mecca. And Muhammad viewed it as a sign from God that God had established his prophetic apostleship. And they, they look at the miracle of the Battle of Badar like Christians would look at the first public miracle of Christ at the wedding of Cana. It's that holy of an event for them in their narrative. And after the Battle of Badar, there were prisoners. And Muhammad ordered them to have their necks cut slowly. And Arzakawi knew this. And he said of Muhammad that he is our example. He is a good role model. There are many Quranic verses that talk about Muhammad. Now remember, Muhammad's words and deeds are called the Hadith and the Sunnah, but the Quran, according to the Muslim paradigm, are the words of God. Well, in the Quran, God says that Muhammad is the best exemplar, the best example of what a devout Muslim does, how he lives, 
what he says, how he orders his affairs, how he treats his enemies. So when al Zarqawi was about to cut off Nicholas Berg's head, he said, Muhammad is our example. And the simple fact is that most Muslims, many if not most, literally don't know their own history. They don't know that Muhammad ordered captives to be killed, decapitated in a torturous manner. But the devout do. And they're following the example of Muhammad. So much for this being a religion of peace. In other devout Islam news, an instructor, a high-level instructor for devout Muslims, killed himself and 22 of his students and injured 15 others. In the nation of Iraq, there was a terrorist training school in the hinterlands, and the bomb instructor showing the men how to build and to detonate a suicide bomb as they are called, or a murder engine, he accidentally detonated the belt. 22 would-be terrorists were dead along with him and 15 others injured. Keep up the good work, guys. All right, let's go on to uh, Boehner and Schumer. House Speaker Boehner has said that he is backing off of his push for illegal immigrants to be brought into the system. And Charles Schumer, senator from New York, has, has suddenly done an about-face as well and, say, and said, there's no big rush. Now, it doesn't smell right to me. It doesn't pass the smell test. Because Boehner was saying, I think that we need to move in this direction. You've got a lot of Republicans that want to vote for this. You've got Democrats clamoring for it. And then suddenly they both back off. Why? Well, first let's talk about why they want it. And then let's talk about why they backed off. The Chamber of Commerce is a, a bastion of conservative-minded businessmen who would tend to be more free enterprise and hence a little bit more pro-Republican. And they are pushing the GOP and the Democrats to somehow get these illegals, as we call them, to become legals. And the reason is because they need the labor. They need cheap labor. And they don't want federal agents knocking on the door of their business, whether it's their restaurant or their construction firm, and saying, show us proper identification for all these workers. In a community near us in West Virginia, there was a recent incident where a roof was being replaced or repaired on top of a Walmart. And somebody tipped off federal authorities that some of the labor force that was up on the roof were not properly legalized aliens, all right? They were from Latin America. And the authorities came, asked for proper ID, wasn't given, and they literally took them away. Nine or 10 guys just drove off with them and incarcerated them. And so this, this uh, construction man lost his entire crew, couldn't finish the job, and it went to someone else. There was, there was some bad blood between some of the contractors. But the point, coming back to the Chamber of Commerce, they don't want that. They don't want any federal agent knocking on their door or showing up at a work site. They want these inexpensive laborers to be legal. So that's where the push is coming from, from the Chamber of Commerce. With the Democrats, the push is coming because they want a new voting block. As I've discussed on earlier shows, and I encourage you to go back and look at the origin with Lyndon Baines Johnson literally creating a, a, a bought and paid for voting block with his so-called great society programs and his war on poverty. The goal the Democrats have now is to get these people legalized and then have them become citizens so that they become a voting block for the Democratic Party because most of the foreigners who are considered illegal aliens at this point, most of them want the free stuff. 
unlike some of our forebears that came here 200 years ago, or even 150 years ago, or 300 years ago, who wanted freedom, there are people coming because they want free stuff. They want Obamacare. They want their children to have subsidized or free education. They want the perks that the federal plantation is now doling out. And so if they, the Democrats can get these people to become citizens, then like the African-American community was brought into the fold of the Democratic Party by President Johnson, these illegal aliens become legal aliens, become citizens, will vote to put Democrats in power and to perpetuate these programs. So when Schumer says there's no urgency and Boehner says he's backing off, we know that there's a problem. And by the way, Boehner's backing off because there's a lot of reports that his speakership would be over if he pushed this through. That the Republican rank and file in the House of Representatives would revolt and throw him out. So he's backpedaling. Schumer's saying, nah, there's no hurry. I think what we might see is a lame duck session after the 2014 election, a lame duck session that just sticks us all in the back and says, oh, you wanted illegal immigrants to become legal? Here you are. English authorities, and I don't mean the teachers of English in America, but I mean people in England, have released a study that showed that over 5,000 young British children under the age of 10, over 5,000 of them are being treated right now for clinical depression, all right? The number is far higher in the United States of America, if my memory is correct from what I've read. But listen to these two quotes. Every day we hear about the unprecedented toxic climate young people face in a 24 seven online culture where they can never switch off, where they experience constant assessments at school, bullying, sexualization, consumerism, and pressure to have the perfect body at a young age. This leads to thousands of young people, including children, suffering a range of mental health problems such as anxiety, extreme stress, and depression, as these statistics show. <clears throat> what was wrong with that statement? Every day we hear about, <clears throat> excuse me, the unprecedented climate, toxic climate young people face in a 24 seven culture where they can never switch off. Stop. Yes, they can. They don't have to have an iPad. They don't have to be forced to go to a public school where there's bullying and sexualization. I mean, if you think, <clears throat> for those of us that are, I, I went to public school. I remember a lot of bad things happening on the bus, for example. Some of you do. Some of you were in inner city schools or big schools where there was a lot of problems, where there was drugs, where there was bullying, where there was violence. I remember being terrified of certain people, getting jumped, getting beat up being literally knocked out by a kid who took a huge candle sitting three feet away from me, threw it with all his might and hit me in the side of my head and knocked me out cold. I don't think that God who made heaven and earth ordained that our children be put in a situation where they have to face these problems. Are you hearing me? I have small children. My children aren't experiencing bullyism. They're, they're not bullying. They're not experiencing sexualization. They're not experiencing consumerism, 24 constant online pressure, pressure to have the perfect body. They're not experiencing it. And they're not suffering from depression because of these horrific influences that are happening around them. And the reason is because we chose the sacrificial, difficult path of homeschooling. It ain't easy. Okay, but our children are safer. And I believe that God did not equip children with the means emotionally, psychologically, intellectually, verbally. He did not equip children with the means to even deal with this stuff. I mean, think about it. If you, ma'am, or you, sir, are in a job situation 
where you're experiencing these things, what do you do? You quit? You ask for a transfer? Or you ask that certain other people be brought into the office, disciplined, or fired, right? In other words, you don't just sit there and hover because you've got the tools, because you're an adult, okay? But you don't leave yourself in that situation week after week, month after month, year after year. You get out. But we put our kids in a situation from which there is no escape unless we provide the escape route because they're our kids. <clears throat> and of course, the answer for many of these so-called professionals, because they've got this horrible toxic thing going on around them and they're all depressed and they're nervous and they've got ADD and ADHD is what? Give them drugs. Pump them full of drugs that God only knows what it will do to their psyche and to their body for the rest of their lives. I keep coming back to this because our children are the only precious eternal thing that God gives us in this life except for our own souls. And we have a duty before our maker to see that our children are not put in a circumstance like this and to make the sacrifices necessary to home educate them or to put them in a safe private school or to move to another city or to do something where our children are not victims to this type of unthinkable oppressive culture. This is the voice of resistance, not acceptance. One of our children is being treated for cancer at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital here in Memphis, Tennessee. That's why we're in this temporary studio and I ask you for prayers for him. His name is Michael and pray that God will bring healing in his body. St. Jude was started by entertainer, TV star, Danny Thomas. And as a child, I watched Make Room for Daddy or The Danny Thomas Show. And I recently read his autobiography entitled Make Room for Danny. And a lot of what he talked about was in the entertainment industry. In entertainment news, you may have followed that very recently Jay Leno went off the air really for the last time. He is done. He's not moving to another time slot. Jimmy Fallon is taking over. They're actually moving The Tonight Show from Los Angeles to New York and they've laid off the entire staff. I watched the farewell episode of Johnny Carson way back in, I think it was 1991, and Jay Leno, both of them tearful farewells. Let's just watch some of their closing clips. You people watching, I can only tell you that it has been an honor and a privilege to come into your homes all these years and entertain you. And I hope when I find something that I want to do and I think you will like and come back that you'll be as gracious inviting me into your home as you have been. I bid you a very heartfelt good night. You know, it's fun to kind of be the old guy and sit back here and see where the next generation takes this great institution. And it really is. It's been a great institution for 60 years. I'm so glad I got to be a part of it. But it really is time to go. Hand it off to the next guy. It really is. And in closing, I want to quote Johnny Carson, who was the greatest guy to ever do this job. And he said, I bid you all a heartfelt good night. So, to be honest with you, I got emotional both times that I saw it because they are icons, both of them are icons in TV comedy. But as I thought about their shows and thought about Danny Thomas and thought about what entertainment was and what, is, what it has become, I started to become a little troubled, a little bit sad. Because if you look at the progression of The Tonight Show in particular, or if you look at the progression of TV entertainment in general, it doesn't take a prognosticator or a prophet or anyone with real great discernment to recognize that we've gone from a pretty high pinnacle into the sewer. I mean, think of the TV shows that Danny Thomas was involved in. The Danny Thomas Show, Make Room for Daddy. He was the executive producer of Andy Griffith and of Gomer Pyle. Uh, the Dick Van Dyke Show, he had his hand in that. Then you had other staples like Bonanza, the Waltons, Little House on the Prairie, 
Hawaii Five O, e even the cop shows, like Columbo and Magnum PI, they didn't have this horrific violence and this tawdry, uh, debauched sexual element going on. Picture that era, and now Miley, what's her name? Miley Thomas or T Miley Cyrus and, and Beyonce and and these some of these male dancers and male artists and th Big Bang Theory and th Two and a Half Men. I mean, some of these shows are just so debauched. And Danny Thomas in his autobiography really praised the fact that the shows he was involved with had a message. They had a moral. And storytelling is a very critical part of the formation of a person's conscience and what they value. Much of the Old Testament is stories. Look at the book of Judges. Look at 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles. These are stories and there is a moral to the story. Danny Thomas said, this is what television used to be. There was a moral to the story. And now there's an immoral story. And there is a, a deliberate attempt to draw young viewers and old viewers for that matter, but especially young viewers into a frame of mind and into a lifestyle that is inherently at odds with Judeo-Christian law and with the Christian faith. As we watch out for our kids, we need to be really careful what they're watching on television or online and in a movie theater because it gets in their head and it affects the way to behave.